ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's event. I'm Tamika Tilleman. I lead the Digital Impact and Governance Initiative at New America, affectionately known as Digi. And we are fortunate on the Digi team to work with government, civil society, and the private sector in developing groundbreaking technology solutions for public challenges worldwide. Much of our work involves mobilizing unconventional coalitions, and we have a prime example of that today. We want to thank the organizations that have collaborated to make this project and this event happen. The U.S. Department of State, uh, the SHINE program at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Consensus, our technical partner, uh, and Levi Strauss Foundation. If you are looking for analogies, they and the speakers participating in today's session are kind of like uh, the uh, 1927 New York Yankees when it comes to the use of tech and social impact. And so we are extremely grateful to each of them for lending their genius and capacity to this effort. A few words about the roadmap for today's event. We're going to begin with a quick overview of the project and the research it involves, uh, and then pivot into a conversation about the broader worker welfare landscape and the implications of this project on that ecosystem. Uh, and then we'll close out with some Q&A. We are going to cover a lot and we will cover it quickly. Please don't blink or you may miss something. The chat, as Angela mentioned, is open. We trust you all to use it responsibly. We don't do that for every event, uh, so we're counting on you. But please share insights with your fellow audience members. New America team members will also be using the chat to share links to resources that we're going to be discussing in the course of the conversation. Uh, also, as Angela mentioned, during the second half of the event, please put questions for the panelists in the Q&A tab uh, at the bottom of your, of your screen or into the chat if that's easier. With that, we are off. We're looking forward to this, and I will hand things over to Allison and Eloisa. Hi, thank you to Micah. Eloisa, do you want to get the slides up? Great. So um, I want to thank, uh, take a moment to thank Tamika for introing us. And um, I'm Allison Price. I'm with New America, uh, and I'm the project manager for this work. First things first, the big picture, the why. Why did we connect a factory worker health and well-being survey to blockchain? And the simple answer is trust. You're going to hear us keep coming back to building trust in all aspects of this work throughout our webinar today. But the mission here is to empower more productive, well-run factories with healthier and happier workers. Next slide, please. Let's level set. According to the World Health Organization, over 50% of workers in many countries have no social protection and are subject to lax enforcement of occupational health and safety standards. For this work, we worked with three key stakeholders and we are focused on for this use case, we have uh, factory workers, this group may wrestle with mistrust and job insecurity. Many workers are not able to safely report challenges without fear of reprisal. We're also working with the brands, factories, or CSR initiatives, and they have a hard time piecing together the full puzzle without a workforce wide view. Audits often yield an incomplete picture for decision making. And finally, we have the surveyors or the researchers. They're independent outsiders in the system and they may have to sacrifice good data for privacy, which ultimately undermines efforts to develop responsive interventions. Together, we collaborated to research, design, and deploy a system to disrupt the status quo, allowing for stakeholders to better advocate for change. Eloise is gonna jump in here and explain why Shine at Harvard focuses on tracking well-being, how people experience work, and how to support, excuse me, how to support sustainable organizations. Eloisa. Thank you, Allison. I'm Eloisa. I'm a research manager at Shine and also responsible for managing this initiative from the research side. So I'll explain a little bit our approach to well-being to help clarify why blockchain is so vital in moving our research and public health forward. So the way we currently measure impacts, not just in the garment industry, um, but in all, across all industry is incomplete and many times late and inaccurate. 
we are measuring the tip of the iceberg through these current standard reporting metrics. Uh, and here in this slide, you can see a few of the ones that we use specifically in the garment industry. But this prevents us from seeing what's really going on, what's below the tip of the iceberg. And the use of automation, AI, human, human interconnectivity, information technology, it all requires us a more sophisticated approach to assessing how healthy are these supply chains, how healthy are these organizations overall with all the people involved, right? Um, so in a VUCA world, we need to account for the complexity, for the nuances, for the ambiguity, the not so obvious connections. So at Shine, we use a systems approach to account for all of this. And so for us, me, looking below the tip of the iceberg includes looking at the work arrangements, the experience of culture, the experience of work, as well as the values and belief. And what we're actually talking uh, and what we're actually saying is that we need to look at the complexity of the human experience at work and in life. So how do we do that through research? we look at systemic well-being. So in order to capture the full breadth and depth of the complex and dynamic systems in which we all operate, Shine has developed the framework to understand the individual and organizational components of well-being and identify the ways in which they are interconnected. So we first look at how people are flourishing at the individual level. How are they doing in life and at work? And we also measure what are the resources that are needed to support this flourishing and consequently create or sustainable organizations. As we have seen from the COVID pandemic, people's well-being and business success are intrinsically related. So diving deeper a little bit into those three major components of systemic well-being, the first one I mentioned is flourishing in life. And the way we measure it is through looking at these six dimensions here on the screen. So it's not just physical and mental health, but it's also character and virtue. It's social connection. It's happiness and life satisfaction. It's financial well-being, and it is also meaning and purpose. Um, we also measure the flourishing at work dimension through several metrics that you can see here. And lastly, as I mentioned before, we measure those regenerative resources that will leverage human flourishing. I won't go into all these aspects here, but what we're actually measuring here is the psychological, the social, and the physical aspect of work. And then we connect all the dots to allow us to see with the full picture of all those things we need to measure to account for those nuances I mentioned before and the complexity of our own human experience. So I just want to call out here on the caring culture piece, which is usually invisible to all of us, but it's also commonly the component in, in our research that is strongly contributing to engagement, to performance, and to well-being overall. And caring culture in our definition here involves treating people with respect, with trust, and with fairness. So why having a systemic approach helps? Well, through more sophisticated analysis than the common compliance metrics allows for the innovative insights. We're looking at the feedback loops, at the relationships, at those weak signals. And secondly, having data directly from workers through the trust process that we establish gives us a better sense of the reality. And lastly, it allows for regenerative action. It's not just about decreasing foot footprints, but it's also it's about making the experience of work better. So I'll hand it over back to Allison to talk about the blockchain component of this. Thanks, Allison. No problem. So we we really did have the perfect storm to develop this proof of concept we call Survey Assure. First, we had a united coalition. We really do have an enthusiastic and supportive team committed to developing a strong solution. Obviously our team at New America, Consensus helped with the tech and programming, their Ethereum blockchain experts, Shine and Harvard had the research and the survey, Levi's foundations and Levi's vendors were trusting us with this partnership. Manaus is an on the ground, um, helped us with on the ground logistics and translators and the US State Department supported this work through a federal grant. So we had a very strong team. And the second component is the fact that we're working with an existing survey. We have a proven workforce survey backed by years of research to measure all the workplace dimensions Eloisa just described. There's 92 questions to the survey. 
plus uh, questions that we added in 2020 um, to account for uh, the COVID pandemic. Shine has trusted on the ground experience with the Levi's brand and both factory workers and leadership that we piloted, with, piloted the solution with in Mexico in 2019. In 2020, because of the pandemic, we are able to quickly pivot and deploy a remote solution with factory workers in Poland with greater accessibility to smartphones and data. The third component here is obviously the tech and I'm gonna spend a little time here. We, have, we use the Ethereum blockchain and um, our user-driven design led to an open source web-based platform powered by the Ethereum blockchain. I know there's a whole bunch of words in there, but the, the, the root of it is it's accessible by all levels of factory workforce. Survey is sure what we built is really a layer. It's essentially a reader or a guardian, a, a translator of data that can work with existing survey software because it's API optimized. In this case, we layered it onto the survey system that Harvard uses, which is Qualtrics. Next slide. So why blockchain? In short, blockchain introduces a transformative new approach that has benefits for all stakeholders by increasing trust and decentralizing the data. As many of you know, blockchain is the tech behind cryptocurrencies and, and we're putting crypto aside today um, and we're focusing on blockchain and what it can do to democratize data. Because of blockchain, the platform that we built is transparent, immutable and auditable. This gives the data added value and integrity as well as peace of mind for the participants. There've been a lot of learnings associated with this project and we'd be the first to caution that the power of blockchain isn't needed for all use cases. Blockchain does have challenges. It is still relatively new. There's a lack of general understanding. There's scarce talent who can work with it and it adds to expenses in terms of using an advanced technology. But for this civic innovation, it worked with our goals because of one, decentralized data reassures workers that survey results can't be manipulated and remain pseudo-anonymous. Two, immutable and transparent with tamper resistant records accessible to workers to prove that their answers have been included with authentic responses. And three, it worked well with our design priorities to be flexible and replicable. The system, as I said, is web-based. It can be administered in person or remotely. And again, it works with APIs. Open source ensures that other organizations could adapt this tool to create industry-wide data ecosystems for improving workplace conditions and helping brands make ethical and better business decisions. Next slide. So the result is better outcomes. The features of blockchain can contribute to better outcomes that improve the ecosystem for all stakeholders working together towards the main goal to empower more productive factories with happier and healthier workers. We aren't the first civic use case using the features of blockchain to improve the human condition. There are many other pilots around the world tracking sustainable resources or fair trade origination, for example. But in this case, we added a blockchain layer to an existing survey for the workers, there's no perceptible difference in the experience in taking the survey. They still use tablets or phones with existing survey software, but where there's a big change rests in the results. The transparency of the workforce wide view and the speed it is compiled. When we were in Mexico, we shared results of the survey within hours of the last survey completed. That was an exciting first, but there's a lot more that can be done with this first step. Business information could also be layered, things like purchasing decisions or clock in, clock out data to offer a fuller picture. Uh, next slide. I'm gonna quickly dive into the system to show you how we linked results to blockchain. So this is a screenshot from SurveySure with representation of responses from the survey we did in Poland. You'll see the user experience is quite simple. Please note a few things. First, the sidebar over here, hopefully my mouse is gonna show you what I'm talking about. This sidebar here covers all the topics that were addressed in the survey, the ones Eloisa described. And this sidebar menu makes jumping through the raw results easy. But the big piece of meat here are these audit buttons. Um, I've circled them in red. There's an audit button on each section of question results. Anyone looking at results of a survey could click on these audit buttons. And for each question and see, next slide, pretend I've just clicked on an audit button, aha. Okay, so this is the back end data captured from each 
question response in the form of a hash recorded from the survey, logged on blockchain and shared through Survey Assure. Again, this is really, my colleague likes saying, it's the techie heart of the system. Um, and it's the proof that the records are real and they weren't tampered with. You'll see that the data, the response, the, the, the date, excuse me, you will see that the date the response was created and imported and recorded are different. For added security for the identities of the workers, we recommend batch importing. You will see the hash is also hyperlinked in the blues. Um, users, if they're inclined, could click on each response and confirm it's on the Ethereum blockchain. It isn't identifiable. There's no private information out there. It's just a hash that's encrypted. Basically, it's the backbone of any blockchain system. We could spend hours going deeper here on blockchain, I will spare you. Um, but I find the idea of democratizing data fascinating, and we wanted to share with you how and why we believe the solution adds much needed trust to this ecosystem. I'm gonna hand the presentation back over to Eloisa to talk about her team's response um, to what was built and what they can do with the trusted data, but I'm happy to answer any questions on blockchain in the Q&A. Eloisa. Thanks, Allison. So just going over a little bit more in depth what Survey Assure can do, it, it also enables us to communicate the complex analysis and, and synthesis that we researcher love, researchers love and provide uh, using these composite scores. So as Allison mentioned, we, we ask over 90 questions, which is needed for us to map that whole system of dimensions that I mentioned before. But it's also important to synthesize all that data. So using these composite scores that you're seeing on the screen now allows for a quick and accessible format for workers, for vendors, and for brands. So this helps everyone see immediately what's actually happening at the factory floor and also be able to make better decisions for all the stakeholder involved. And also it builds on the trust, what we've been talking over and over again, because having these results in near real time will allow people to trust their responses are not being filtered or not being tampered with. Um, and then moving on to the next What's next for us? As, as Allison mentioned, it's a perfect storm of uh, all of us, but it's a perfect storm for big dreamers. This is where we want to go. What we really want with the blockchain, using blockchain for measuring well-being, it's to make the invisible visible. So we want to map out at two different le levels. First, this is a, just a mock-up of what we imagine the world to be like with blockchain being used for measuring well-being. Um, we want to be able to see clearly, visually, um, where, where factories and workers are flourishing, where they're improving, or where they're, they're just surviving. So when we're able to put everything on the map, visual, literally and visually, we will make the problems we need to solve very visible. And in order to solve problems, we really need to see them clearly, like a, this mock-up in the, in the slide. Um, the second aspect of mapping is through the different layers of data. So once we integrate the data on human flourishing at the factory level, business flourishing at the vendor level, and purchasing practices at the brand level, we will have a complete picture, see the whole iceberg, which will enable us to make better decisions for everyone's lives and businesses. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Kim from Levi Strauss Foundation and Eileen McNeely from Harvard so they can have a conversation on what all this means to all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eloisa. Um, I'm really looking forward to having a time to reflect with Kim. Uh, we've, uh, I'm Eileen McNeely. I'm the director of Shine at Harvard. And Kim is at the Levi's Strauss Foundation. And she is also the worker well-being champion, I call her, because <laughs> she has not only brought um, the opportunity to pilot in Levi's supply chain, but brought on other collaborative brands as well, Target, Eileen Fisher. So um, we really have the possibility to see different places, different products and see how this really works in real time. So thank you, Kim. I'm looking forward to thinking about when we started on this journey, uh, 2017, um, to try and impact worker well-being. I was very excited 
as a public health researcher because the apparel supply chain, we had been measuring well-being in all kinds of settings, but I was really excited about the apparel supply chain because we are talking about vulnerable regions of the world and vulnerable populations. So from a public health point of view, I was very excited. Um, Thinking back to those early days, what were you thinking about uh, <laughs> measuring well-being in the supply chain? Thank you, Eileen, and thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. And I'll be the first to say that I am no tech expert and I am not a blockchain expert. Um, but really, the potential for me was to see and to examine and to innovate on new ways to measure. So that really was what drew me to this collaboration. And I have to also acknowledge Eileen's persistence in this. I think you say 2017, but I think we go back further than that. And certainly Eileen's emails thinking about blockchain and encouraging me to also think about blockchain as a potential um, tool that we could leverage for, for our joint efforts go, go way back further than that. So by the time 2017 rolled around, um, I think I was warming up to the idea of, of, of really looking at, at blockchain as a potential innovative solution for some of our work. Um, so in terms of you know, what, what, why Levi Strauss Foundation is investing in worker well-being and why this area and, and, and topic is of interest to me personally, you know, we've, we made a commitment back in 2011 as a company and as a foundation to invest in the health and well-being of apparel workers making our products. Now, at the time, we had the best of intentions, but I think we had a very, very um, superficial understanding of what well-being is and honestly how it manifests in the workplace. And after several years piloting um, programs in partnership with our supply chain, we realized that we needed to deepen our understanding and, un and, and understand the impact that we could have in the workplace. And those efforts drew me to shine and the work that Eileen and her team are driving at, at Harvard, you know, to, 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 to deepen our understanding of what the drivers for well being at the workplace are. And that partnership has been ongoing really for the past five years. And I would say we're in a continuous state of, of learning. And part of that learning for the Levi Strauss Foundation, um, who's committed to investing in worker health and well being, but also creating. Um, an approach that can be replicable and shared with not only the apparel industry, but the, but the broader community of practice, right? Like what we're learning in our supply chain isn't particular only to the apparel space. These are insights that can be leveraged and, and, and used um, across supply chains globally. So really looking at how we can unlock that, that, that potential. And blockchain to me um, represented an innovative space that was worth exploring. And it's not necessarily about the tool itself, but rather, you know, how do we use this tool as a means to an end? And the end that we want is to really to put well being on the map. You know, as Eloisa and Allison just walked us through, you know, there's, there's very little information that's put on the map in terms of what people need in the workplace and honestly what their potential is. And I think our effort has really been to try to put that potential on the map along with the business impacts and the business metrics so that we have a transparent system where we can where we can see you know how worker well-being is connected to retention and absenteeism rates um, and and you know how the company's practices and the company by 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 which i mean you know levi strauss and company how decisions that we make upstream impact worker well-being downstream and blockchain offered one, one potential tool to be leveraged to explore those connections. And Eileen has really been, you know, leading that, leading that charge with us. You know, uh, Kim, thinking about when we started way back when, before <laughs> the blockchain, we really had to do, um, create a new path. Mm -hmm. And it was about the opportunity for workers to be surveyed. Yeah, I was thinking about that because I think this is really important as people can understand how this happens. And I, I was thinking about this when I was preparing for our talk and I was, do you remember when we approached factory managers about the possibility of surveying the workforce? Do you, do you remember the kind of response and reactions we got? Uh, I'll just say from, for me, it was like, well, that's impossible. We'd have to shut down the line. Uh, you know, how do we do this? We couldn't possibly do this. 
Um, so I, I'm struck by that early beginning and where we are now. Do you, re do you remember that? Absolutely. I mean, we spent what five hours in a van ride in Sri Lanka talking about it. So we had we had quite a bit of time, um, and and many conversations with factory um, managers and owners. I mean, I think it's always it takes one factory to open up the doors of what's possible, right? And I think we had a really willing partner in Sri Lanka that was willing to go out there and explore a type of survey that had never been done before in factories. And I think the first response, more um, most the most common response that we've that we've gotten has been, you know, no, this isn't possible. It's going to be extremely disruptive. And I think that even, you know, going back to this principle of trust, Right. I think the, the the biggest piece, Eileen, that I think that we can we can say really helped us advance these conversations was building a, a, a trusting relationship with the factory management of saying, you know, we're in this together. This is information that will help us as a brand. It will help the field to understand and put well-being on the map. But you as a factory owner, aren't you curious to understand what your workers are feeling and experiencing on a day to day basis? And you know, when we have a common goal and a common aspiration, it becomes a lot easier to explore solutions, right? So some of the solutions that were mostly logistical and administrative around, you know, how do you get thousands of workers off the line to go into an area designated for surveys and not be disruptive to the business? You know, I think those challenges um, became easier to overcome when the possibilities for what this could actually mean for the business and for us was, you know, once those aspirations were out there and that we had a common vision, I think the, the logistics um, became easier to overcome. And honestly, I would also say that we had an amazing team in place that was able to, you know, take these, these challenges and, and, and examine them one by one and say, okay, well, if your challenge is removing people from the line, how can we set this up so that it is, you know, how can we be as mo most efficient, how can we do this in the most efficient way possible being less, least, least disruptive. And I think I lean to, to what you've done and really helped us see was, you know, why are we always putting these decisions in the hands of management? What if we actually empowered the workers to come up with solutions and come up with ideas about how to streamline this process? And what we've seen across the board in all of these factories is that workers are part of the solutions for how to make this a streamlined process that is least disruptive, right? So I think, it's a combination of, of trust and willingness and having a common, a common aspiration. Mm. You know, thank you for that. You reminded me that the model that we set up in the factories was really run by the workers themselves. So they set up all the tables. They were part of uh, learning how to run the tablets um, and part of talking about the research so that people could trust and feel confident in it. And uh, you reminded me again how trust was not only important in, in trying to communicate that with the workers, but with managers as well. Because what they were asking us was, um, well, what could we possibly learn from this? And mm -hmm. what are good marks, bad marks? We don't want to fail. Will the brand find out? Will we get our hands slapped? And so really walking through, you know, that this is really a continuous process improvement um, opportunity that everyone can bring their voice to the table and that the good, the goal is not, you know, red light, green light. It's about getting better every day. Um, so it was those conversations that brought everyone to the table. Um, you know, the other part that was really amazing to me early on when I think back was the reactions of the workers when mm -hmm. we started doing this. Do you remember that? I, I, would, I thought yeah. that was really fascinating. Well, and this is where it really opened my eyes to, you know, I, I, I have a, a, a background in, in, in social compliance, auditing, um, labor auditing and factory. So that 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 approach of, you know, choosing a few workers, pulling them off the line and having a very short and brief conversation with them is sort of the, the model that I had in my mind because it's what I'd experienced. And I think the 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 difference between what we're doing here is that we're really giving people and workers the space to answer questions that they've never been asked before and to show them that we care about them as, as humans, as individuals, um, and we care about their experience at work. 
Um, and I'm remembering back to some of the early days um, of, 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 of our survey work together, Eileen, and people just coming up after the survey and saying, no one's ever asked me these questions before. And how much time we spent even translating some of these concepts, right? Because, you know, whether they're Western concepts or not, I think sometimes even just understanding how how you you would translate something like mental health into you know Sinhalese and understanding that wow there's actually quite a quite a different dimension of you know how this could be translated right or I'm thinking back to like depression as a concept and how many different words they had to describe what depression could mean so really I think it's the nature of the questions um, that in many ways no one had um, taken the time to to ask workers about these about these types of questions or given them the real opportunity to have the space um, and the um, the anonymity to answer in a really sincere way. And that's something that we took very seriously, um, you know, and, and, and blockchain certainly helped make that even clearer to workers that, you know, this is an ano anonymous survey, your, you know, there's fully full confidentiality. Um, but really, even that process took a while to um, instill in workers. It, they, you know, there's so much distrust in the system that even after running the survey one or two years, I still felt like we, we, we still, and we still continue to have, um, I think, some, some element of distrust in the system. And those are, these are certainly challenges that we're, that we're still trying to overcome. But I think the, the, the blockchain survey tool helped it helped us get one step closer to that full, 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 full confidence and trust in the survey itself. Mm. You know, like you, I was really, so we ran focus groups after we started these surveys just to see how they were being interpreted and received. And it was really striking to hear comments like, I feel cared for. Mm -hmm. Nobody mm -hmm. asked me those questions yeah. ever before. And sometimes uh, we got responses that people even didn't share some of the information yeah. with their own family. Uh, yeah. So this was a space to think about well-being, like what is my well-being? What is it at mm -hmm. work that makes me feel better or worse? Yeah. And so it was really quite striking that that workers were asked and they felt very proud and grateful for that. So and Eileen, if I could interrupt one other thing that I think is worth pointing out that Allison mentioned in her comments, but I want to come back to, is that you know I've been I've been working in factories um, for the past 15, 20 years, um, and my experience in in factories goes way back to to my childhood. But one thing I had never seen before in my entire experience was having workers themselves see the results of the surveys that they participate in. Mm -hmm. You know, we're really good as brands um, at asking information of people. But we're very, very, very um, poor at actually circling, circling back and telling people that share their personal information with, with us what that actually means and what we're going to do about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, through the work with, with, with Eileen and, and the Shine team, we've really, really learned the importance of circling back and saying, this is what we heard from you, and here's what we're going to be doing about it, right? And this is the art of translating the, the research findings into actionable steps for our factories um, and our supply chain, which is something that, that I spend a lot of my, my, my time working on. But I think the power of being able to circle back with workers quickly after the survey happens so you don't lose that, that momentum and that steam is so, so powerful. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to Mexico where we did the survey, um, you know, on the blockchain and within a day or two, we showed workers the results of their surveys on screens in the factory. And just the power of seeing workers um, congregating around these screens and looking at the results and pointing at the results and talking amongst themselves about what that meant is so, so powerful. And I think for, for, for factories, even to have that trust with management to say, you know, that management feels comfortable sharing that information back with workers in a way that's very open and transparent of saying, hey, we heard some, 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 pretty, um, some pretty bad stuff here, right? Like there's, there's some issues that came up here um, that 
we as management would, would not necessarily want all workers to know about, but we believe in the transparency and the trust in the system, and we're gonna put it out there. So I think that's really powerful. And even taking that one step fo forward, and I think probably you'll get there, Eileen, but you know, just thinking about the power of showing information transparently with workers, with management, with brands, but I think in the future, even thinking about consumers, right? Like if consumers could have this information, what types of decisions would they be making? Because even when we're looking at putting things on the map, right now we're stopping at the brand level. But what does it really look like to share this, this information transparently and openly with consumers of these brands so they understand you know, the, the experiences of people making their products and, the, and, the per and, the, and, and, and also the impacts that their purchases can have on people's lives. So sorry to interrupt you, Eileen, but I just wanted to put that out there. Actually, you went to my uh, final question, which is what is the moonshot for this blockchain technology? And I think really having that end-to-end -end insight about the experience of people across the value chain, just like we already have for the planet side. Mm -hmm. We know, you know how much energy is consumed in making a product, in, in shipping a product, in um, you know, wearing a product and all of those things and discarding. And so we track all of that material flows, mm -hmm. not the people. And yeah. this is really an innovation that it's whose time has come. And I think that for me, the biggest learning has been this, you know, how do you build trust and transparency? And it was really cool to see, you know, in the beginning, managers kind of holding on to information and say, will I be punished? You know, can I, uh, maybe we shouldn't share this or that to fully sharing. And then when it on, went on the blockchain, sharing it in real time. Management it did learn at the same time that the workers did. That was a first ever. And I have never seen that in any workplace, in a corporate office here in the United States. It was really amazing. Uh, and with that, it kind of um, normalized this process. It was uh, building trust and inclusivity so that everybody's voice counted. Um, we developed conventions about the metrics, what we call things, how they're interpreted. Uh, we provided an analytical model to develop priorities about what the work impacts are on people's well being. And we shifted the conversation from avoiding harms or risks or doing just enough to improving people's lives and the business and tweaking that every day so that we're, as we're getting better and better at enhancing it. Um, so I thought that for me, this was something to see the evolution of it, that, that when we got to blockchain was amazing because it was unfiltered and the trust was so well built by them. Um, so I, I really, really thought it was a great chance to see that and I, I like the moonshot of having everybody see it, consumers, investors, yeah. um, you know, people in the corporate office could see what happens on the factory floors and vice versa. Um, it, it would be really cool for having that visibility uh, on something and an immutable ledger like blockchain and that we could have the world map where we could look at not only the regions where the supp supply chains are strong, but we can add other data around uh, from public health. I would like to see that good jobs and healthy workers means healthy communities in the developing regions of the world. It would be amazing. So I, I wanna thank you again for the, the opportunity to really play this out. It's been a learning process for me and I'm just thrilled to be working with, uh, with you in your leadership. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eileen. And if I can just, add one more comment before we open it up to Q&A. You know, I think for me, um, this, this, this pilot prototype work is really just, you know, to, to go back to the, uh, to the example that Eloisa used before, it's really just the tip of the iceberg, right? Like we've seen the power of having, of, of using blockchain technology for capturing worker well-being impacts and metrics but we only really scratch the surface for what's possible there. And I think that's really the, the, the opportunity that is in front of us now is to say, we've learned that this works, but how can we take this further? I mean, from, 
from from where I sit within, um, you know, a, a foundation in a company, I think of the power of being able to add additional sources of information onto the system, right? Right now, all we did was capture worker well-being outcomes on this blockchain technology. And I'm, I know I'm not using the, the, the fancy techie words that, that Allison described, but from where I sit, that's the way I look at it. We, 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 we added one input of data, but to think about what's possible for all of, all of us that work in, you know, in sustainability and CSR is to think, you know, what other metrics are factories capable of, of capturing that would give us a more complete picture? And those could be working hours, it could be information on wages and salaries, clock in, clock out information, um, information on um, order orders um, and, and production. And then from the brand side, you know, looking at purchasing practices, right? Like what's happening upstream in terms of that relationship with the, with, with the factories and how do we add that into the system? Because that's the power of really having a transparent um, systems wide view of worker well-being, right? And I think we're just at the beginning of that. Um, so the possibilities are really to me endless and we've, we've shown a proof of concept that's the first step, but there's certainly a lot more um, to be done. And I think we don't necessarily have a pathway for doing that yet, but I have no doubt that, you know, with, 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 this, with this group, we'll continue to innovate um, and would welcome others that are interested in being part of this to join us in the conversation to think about what's possible. Thank you, Kim. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Kim and Eileen. Uh, it was hard to, um, I do want to open it up to the audience, but I know you two can talk about this forever. So thank you both for your thought leaderships on this front. I see Tamika and Eloisa have joined us. Um, we've gotten a number of questions, but I do want to invite the audience to continue putting questions uh, in the Q&A. And I also, um, there was a question about this is a recorded event. We will post it online um, and we will be sharing the slides online as well. Um, okay, there was a number of questions about Mexico and I wanna put you all on the spot a little bit to talk a little bit more about the logistics of doing surveys on the ground in Mexico with the factory. Kim had mentioned about shutting down the line. You guys used um, some of the terms that you use all the time to talk about the logistics here, but can you talk a little bit more about why we did Mexico in person, how there was an opportunity for people, there were open-ended questions at the end where people could add on top of the survey questions that are already predefined. Um, and as well, talk a little bit why we needed to pivot to Poland to do it remotely, because that wasn't going to be an option in Mexico. Um, I know all of you have many thoughts on this front, but I wanted to open it up to see if you could talk a little bit about implementing these systems in Mexico. I, I'm happy to jump in just to start, but at a very high level, and then I look to Eloisa and Eileen to provide the context and the details. From my perspective, why Mexico was we had a really, really solid factory that we had partnered with before. So this was not the first time we were doing the survey there. Um, and honestly, it was just a partner in every sense of the word. They understood what we were doing. They understood the mission. Um, they were eager to explore and innovate with us. Um, so that to me was probably one of the most important, you know, uh, qualifications for any partner, right? That this was, it's a willing partner that had a proven track record of using the survey and really was willing to think outside of the box and, and, and partner with us on this. So from my, from my perspective, um, you know, that certainly came up high on the list and some logistical, you know, additional criteria that made us choose Mexico was just, you know, proximity to, to the team um, and also language issues, right? We're not, Many, many of the, of, of, the, of, the, of the people that were on the ground speak Spanish, including myself. So it made it a lot easier to be able to speak with um, workers and with just the, the factory teams um, in, in a language that most of us speak, um, as opposed to like Sinhala, which would make it a lot more complicated. Um, and then what else would I add? I think those are the big ones for me that really came to the surface, but Eileen and Eloisa, please chime in from, from your, your perspective. I'll just add a couple of thoughts, and that is um, you always want people to participate, but you don't want to pressure them if they don't. So one of the ways this was organized was negotiating with the factory management that workers would get time off the line. 
so that we would shut down a line and everybody could come to the station, they could decide to take it or not, but that was time that they were going to be allowed and cared for to put their voice in. So the other thing that we did, because a lot of garment workers are piece rate workers, and so they, you know, they have their targets. And so we negotiated with management that everyone would still make their average salary uh, with the incentives for the piece rate so that no one is penalized and that this is clearly a message from management that this is important. And so having said that, out of thousands of workers we did in uh, Mexico, we only had a handful who did not want to take the survey. I think that's incredible in saying how much workers wanted to participate and have a voice. And just to add to that, um, why Mexico, we, we had done it before. And so they knew the process. So we had built on the trust with the workers as well. And as you mentioned, Kim, when we had the results out there on the screen, they helped us build those, the images. We went through them. Does this make sense to you? Are you understanding? Are your colleagues understanding? So I think like you mentioned, bringing them to be part of the solution and discussing, does it make sense because we're outsiders? So asking them directly, I think made a lot of difference in, in how the rest of their colleagues saw the results and what we were giving them actually to build on that discussion. It's I'm gonna, um, I know just because we did it in Mexico, there's a direct question about letting workers add, um, add to questions about uncovering unknown issues. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you manage that? Again, it's off, it's off blockchain, but why that's an important part of the uh, survey experience. I can just start here and then uh, please add in Kim and Eloisa, but one of the things that we did when people got up from the survey station is they had a comment box and they could add comments. And we took what was amazing to me because uh, we do a lot of surveys in the United States and people don't usually add so much extra, but we got thousands of comments from workers that took the time to write out qualitatively what their experience was. And then we, we went through and did all the analytics at that. And of course, that was so rich. It was, it was much even, it was, it brought to light things that we didn't ask about, things that we wouldn't have known. And it gave us not just a kind of um, an enumeration of problems, but it gave us this sense of intensity or quality to the problems and to the work environment. It was really great. And just adding to that qualitative piece, which I think is very important, we, our, our team, Manaus, that's not here, but they go back to the, to the ground one month later, three months later, and really trying to understand what's the interpretation? Well, because again, we are outsiders. So what did it mean? Did they understand all the questions in the, in the way that we were intending? So again, we're directly asking the workers, qualitatively speaking, what they understood and, and how the, the, did those response make sense from what we were interpreting. So that's a big piece of our trust process as well. Thanks. Um, so Mike, I'm gonna direct this question to you about replicability or scale. I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about the 80-20 model with just digital public goods in general and let the audience know about some of the thoughts uh, why we make these solutions open source. That's a great question. When we design and build new technology uh, tools for addressing social challenges, what uh, we've recognized is that a lot of different organizations have similar challenges that they're trying to work through. And so rather than having to design every solution brand new from the ground up, there's a very powerful opportunity utilizing open source technology uh, to build one very high quality, what we call 80% solution, where we're hardwiring in all of the accountability, transparency, efficiency, equity that we can to that initial core solution. And then anticipating that each organization that utilizes the tool is going to customize the last 20% to meet their specific needs. That's something we try to do across the board when we are creating. We certainly try to take that approach in this case. But what it means is that it will be easier for any organization that would like to try and adapt this methodology and the survey tool uh, to meet the needs of workers uh, within their communities uh, to, to take what we have developed uh, and just customize a, a few little things on the end 
to ensure that it is adapted to the local circumstances that they might uh, encounter on the ground. What you're able to do if uh, you take this approach uh, is deliver a much higher quality solution uh, at a far more achievable uh, point of investment. Uh, it, it's much more affordable for everybody involved uh, if, if you go this route. Um, we're excited about the potential to scale this solution using that approach and that methodology, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to speak with some of the organizations that are participating uh, in today's meeting after the fact to explore how to do that. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll spare Kim and Eloise and Eileen on weighing in on the tech. Um, <laughs> again, perfect storm. We had policy people and tech people. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, be responsive to another question we got in asking about, is it possible for workers or factories to do this on their own? Do you need a Harvard shine? Do you need the backing of the Levi's Foundation? Do, do you folks have ideas about how this could be sustained um, not with all, not with all of these leaders on this front. So I can I can chime in here from you know from where I sit at the Levi Strauss Foundation. You know the reason we're we're doing all of this this research and pie in the sky thinking innovation around solutions is really to um, to create a blueprint for how do we move the needle on well being and supply chains. You know, you know, I sit within within a foundation that's committed to social impact, and in many ways, I think of myself as having a, a social innovation lab that I get to test ideas out in, in in our supply chain in real time, right? So, and this was exactly that, right? We have an idea around a possible solution. Let's test it out in a supply chain that's willing to allow us to experiment, right? But all of this work is adding to, you know, the blockchain piece, the, the survey work with, with, with Harvard Shine that on, honestly extends beyond just this blockchain um, survey. We've heard from 13,000 workers in our supply chain over the last five years. All of this information is research that we're now translating into business actions to say, you know, we've, we've, we've gathered all this information on what, what actions we as a brand can take, what actions factories can take to move the needle on well-being in really meaningful ways. And I think the, the, the bottom line is that a lot of what we're learning is pretty simple. It's about cultivating cultures of trust, respect, and fairness in factories, which is honestly what all of us want in workplaces, right? When I think of my own work experience, that's what I need, right? I need to be treated, you know, with respect by my by my boss and I wanna be treated fairly by my, my coworkers. So it's really the same things that we're looking at at, 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 at at being what matters most in factories. So we're, we're in the process of translating these research insights into actionable steps for factories. Part of this process will be um, sharing with our supply chain and honestly with the industry um, a, 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 a survey that's based off of Harvard's research, um, but can provide almost like I would say progress milestones to factories on an ongoing basis that can kind of be like a pulse check of how are we doing on well being, right? Because honestly, to me, the end result would be that factories value this information for themselves, right? It's not about the brands holding on to this information. It's as an employer, I care about hearing from my workers. Therefore, there's a need to have, you know, a pulse check survey. So um, I think from my perspective, yes, all of this will be available. And from, a you know, it, we will be sharing it open source in the next few months, so little by little. So check back with the Levi Strauss Foundation. We'll be sharing this with the industry and the field. Um, and, you know, would love to kind of turn it over to Eileen um, and, and Oiza. But what I would also say from my perspective is that the value of being part of a learning partnership is also huge, right? There's certainly the element of the survey itself. Is this going to be open source? Is this going to be available? Yes. But the value of being part of a community of practice and of learning with Shine has been immense for us. And honestly, I feel like I've grown so much in the past five years in working with this team and my understanding around how do you move the needle on well-being, and that comes out of the partnership with with Shine. So I'll, I'll let Shine talk about how they've how they've created this community of practice and and and, and you know how you how how folks can join. So uh, thank you for that, uh, Kim, because for us uh, working with on the factory floor with companies in the in the boardroom and 
is a really, um, it's a learning lab and uh, for all of us and our, our mission is really for um, social impact. And so when the question comes up, you know, how do you scale this? Can you do it without having the whole Shine team? I think the answer is yes, but it is more than just, um, we study wellness programs and people can have an off the shelf program and just uh, put it on the floor and it's not going to thrive. It needs an investment that says, this is what the behaviors that are incentivized. This is the time that we're going to give to hear from workers. This is how we're going to respond to changes. And so it's a, a commitment that is not just putting a wellness program in place. It's something that is part of the production. And so um, I think it's scalable. Uh, there's a lot of lessons that we've learned and I'm happy to share some more. And it is about building a movement of a community of practice. So uh, please talk to us if you wanna be part of the research. Thanks. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, there's two topics we didn't cover and I'm trying to figure out how to do it as quickly as possible. Um, one is the pandemic and just impacts overall. And is there gonna be an increase in interest um, in worker health and well-being? They're just a total landscape shift. And then also in terms of the future and decisions that consumers make, um, is blockchain gonna be helpful on that front? Is the, are these efforts gonna be helpful on that front? Um, take it from either the tech or policy, but perhaps each of you could round out touching on those two points um, in only three minutes. I know you guys could do that for hours, but I just wanted to put those last two points out there. I'll just take 30 seconds on the COVID stuff because what was really helpful um, when we did a remote run of the blockchain in Poland, it was in the middle or the height of the COVID pandemic. And so what we learned is, wow, you get an immediate flavor for what's going on on the floor. We learned about mental health issues. We learned about financial fragility. Uh, these are things that help us respond and adapt sooner. Uh, so having the common language, having the mechanism to do it and be right on the ground when something like this happens helps us adopt and be resilient. So that was really a, a good lesson for us. And I would add on, Allison, just quickly um, to round this out, that I, I think we, we're all familiar with the impacts that the pandemic has had on, on the apparel sector. And it's really been one of the sectors that has been impacted the most with already very vulnerable communities. I think for me, the possibilities here, and, I, and I'm, an, I'm an optimist at heart, is that this, this, this pandemic and the, and the economic crisis has really um, shown a spotlight on issues that we've honestly, this community has known about for, for a long time. But it's been hard to get folks invested in why well-being matters. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, is that these connections between well-being and business resiliency are intricately tied. There are through lines there that aren't that perhaps weren't visible, but are very, very important. So I think that in many ways, the if there is, I, I don't even like the phrase silver lining, but if there is a silver lining here is that there's an urgency around making these connections even clearer that perhaps wasn't even here um, a year or two ago. And I would say that extends even to the brands, right? The connections between how brands um, you know, place orders and the impacts that that can have downstream on factory conditions on, and worker well-being in many ways, those realities have been laid bare um, during this pandemic. So let's, you know, I think for me, the, the question is, how do we, how do we use this moment to, to really create that urgency and build on that urgency um, and continue this work? And just to add a final thought to that is also measuring now that we're again changing, going back to the workplace. What does that even mean, the, this new workplace that we're going back to? So having a clear sense on the ground again of the, the new changes that are coming is also very important to keep track and, and act quickly, right? Thanks, Tamika. Do you want to wrap it up? Sorry, we're running out of time. Well, such a pl privilege to be here with uh, everyone. This is the end of our program, but it is uh, the beginning of the work on these issues. Uh, and it's been such a uh, extraordinary opportunity to collaborate with all of the organizations. 
uh, that have taken part in this work. Uh, we've been encouraged as uh, we've been having this conversation to hear from participants that they would like to use this system uh, in their countries and with their factories, which is exactly what we would hope uh, would occur uh, as a consequence of, of this type of event. Please follow up with Allison, follow up with the amazing speakers that we've all heard from. Uh, and uh, if you weren't paying attention to these challenges prior to the pandemic, you must be paying attention to them now. Uh, I think that is clear and it provides uh, a, a, I think, really critical call to action for all of us uh, to get serious in addressing these issues around the world. Thank you and to be continued.